I'd like to invite you, you'll be helped greatly if you follow along in Romans chapter 6, the entirety of my message is captured in the first 14 verses, and you'll need uh, to know this scripture or have it uh, accessible to you to verify that the things that I'm saying are so. Uh, But first, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your Son that he would die in our place and be raised to life and that you would leave your Holy Spirit until your work on earth is done, that you would supply your people with your sufficient and authoritative word. And now as it is preached, as your word goes out, I pray it will not return empty until it has accomplished in our lives the very thing for which you have purposed it. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, along with his atoning death, is foundational to the Christian faith. We cannot have Christianity without the cross. We cannot have Christianity without the resurrection. And the significance of the resurrection, as you might imagine, is multi-pronged. There are different parts that we glean from the resurrection and are encouraged by. First, the resurrection is the divine verification that the atonement of Christ was effective. You see, if there's any question about whether the death of Jesus on the cross, whether it achieved the thing for which it was designed, well, that question is answered by the resurrection of Christ from the grave. It's the divine approval or verification of the cross. The resurrection verifies that the atonement worked, that it was effective. Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus is significant in that it is the basis for the Christian's own resurrection. It's the basis of our own resurrection. As Paul says later on in Romans 8, 11, He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells within you. Similarly, in 2 Corinthians 4, 14, Paul says, He who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us into his presence. Friends, as we consider this morning and any day, loved ones who have passed away, who have died in Christ, and as we think about their current state, we have reason to be joyful. Though their absence is painfully felt by those left behind, we are nonetheless heartened by the promise that all who die in Christ are currently alive with Him. And the basis of our conviction that they are in God's presence is the resurrection of Jesus. That's why this isn't fantasy. This isn't a fairy tale. If Christ is alive, if he is risen from the dead, then we have a foundation to believe that our loved ones who died in Christ are alive. Because Christ is risen from the dead, all who are united to him will also be raised. This is the fulfillment of what Jesus promised when he said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, will live again. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Needless to say, there is great power in the resurrection of Jesus. The Spirit of God has the power over death itself. 
And what we hear from Paul in Romans 6 is we don't have to wait until we die in order to benefit from the resurrection power. And this is the third point of significance. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, Christians possess the Holy Spirit by faith and have access to his power. So Paul presents the implications of this in chapter 6. And he does so to deal with a distortion that has emerged within the Christian community. You see, as Jesus is set forth as our Savior from sin, some have erroneously concluded that it doesn't matter how we live. It doesn't matter how we order our lives, the habits we engage in. Some showing themselves to be cavalier about their sinful actions. It's because they believe that the abundance of God's grace makes it unnecessary for them to restrain themselves. They imagine that the free gift of righteousness means that they can live in a reckless manner. So Paul responds to this in Romans 6, 1 and following. He asks rhetorically, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means, he says. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Paul goes on to make an analogy in verse 3 and 4, and, and I hope you can track with me in this, uh, because there's some particular theology that we don't want getting tangled as we look at verse 3 and 4. Paul makes an analogy for what he is saying using baptism. And by the way, baptism is, is something that signifies, it's an outward sign that signifies an inward reality. And this is important to bear in mind. Because Paul says here that baptism connects us to the death of Christ. It connects us to the de death of Christ. And we can misunderstand that by thinking that baptism is what makes us a Christian. That it's the act, the outward act of baptism that causes the outward benefits of Christ's death to flow to us. Baptism does not convey the benefits. We're not united to Christ in baptism, but that's what baptism represents. Baptism is representative of our union with Christ, but our union with Christ is not forged by baptism. Our union with Christ is forged by what? Faith. Faith is the instrument that yokes us to Christ and the benefits of his death and resurrection. And we see this in the previous covenant. We know that not every Jew that had the outward sign of circumcision was a true member of the covenant and were saved in the end. The sign of the covenant, circumcision and baptism, in and of themselves cannot save a person. In the case of baptism, it signifies, it represents the connection to the death of Christ and the benefits we derive therein. Paul's point is that if Jesus died to atone for your sin and mine, and if we're now connected to Christ in his death by faith, and connected symbolically in our baptism, how can we ever treat sin lightly? How can we ever continue to live in sin? So now if you move along in the passage, you'll see Paul extends his analogy beyond the identification of the Christian with the death of Christ in baptism, but he extends it to include now the resurrection of Jesus. And the argument is made by Paul through verse 3 and 10. And it goes like this. As we identify with the death of Christ, we become dead to sin. In the sense that we become free from sin's penalty and from sin's power. 
And as we identify with the resurrection of Christ, we become alive to God, and we now have the capacity to walk in newness of life. So you see, there's the death of Christ is analogous to putting to death sin. And the resurrection of Christ becomes analogous to being alive to God and living by His Holy Spirit. In other words, our capacities dramatically change once we are in Christ. There's a huge difference in terms of what we're capable of as we compare before we were in Christ and after we're in Christ. St. Augustine frames this for us. He does so with a kind of before and after picture. Before we are in Christ, we are not able to not sin. I realize that's a lot of negatives, but he, Augustine writes it in Latin, and my Latin's terrible, so you're getting it in English. In our natural state, we are not able to not sin. Sin is inevitable. Naturally, it's our default position. Scripture says naturally we're in bondage to sin. Naturally, we are not able to not sin. However, thanks to the achievements of Christ, and the application of faith by His Spirit, our capacities have been transformed. In Christ, we are now able to not sin. This is a huge deal. I can remember what it was like to be an unbeliever, to not be yoked to Christ, to not be united to Him. I remember the experience of not being able to not sin. I was in bondage. But when we put our faith in Christ, everything changes. Now I admit, we continue to sin. I continue to sin with great regularity, but our sinning is no longer inevitable as it once was. In our natural state, sin was always with us. But in Christ, we no longer need to sin. And this is precisely Paul's point. With resurrection power at our disposal, we need not yield to temptation and sin. Look at verse 6. Our old self was crucified with Christ. And then verse 11. We're now alive to God in Christ Jesus. There's been a positional change and transformation. And there ought to be a profound difference between the way we lived before we were a Christian and the way we live as a Christian. I want to give you a quote from R.C. Sproul that frames this for us. Sproul writes, How can we as Christians identify with his death and not identify with his resurrection? How can we identify with Christ's death on the cross by faith and then continue to live as if nothing has happened, as if there is no new power, as if there is no resurrected life within our souls? You see, Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday are not mere moments in history for us to commemorate. The achievements of Christ on these days provide the Christian with both the position and the power to obey God and to live for Him. And while I may continue to disobey God, while I may continue to sin, the blessed reality is that I'm no longer compelled to. It's not my default. I'm no longer in bondage to sin the way I once was. 
Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, sin is no longer an inevitable, inescapable reality in the life of the Christian. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that indwells the Christian by faith. Friends, think that through. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that dwells within the Christian by faith. It's an awesome reality that Paul is unfolding for us. Now, we've been studying Romans a fair bit in this congregation, and so for some of you, your minds are thinking about the first five chapters of Romans, the chapters that precede our course of study this, this morning. In the first five chapters of Romans, Paul lays out the foundation for our justification, which is by faith. But what he's doing here in chapter 6 is he's turning the page, as it were, and he's moving from the subject of justification to sanctification. And I realize those are big theological words, so I just want to put some definitions up on the screen for you. Justification is that moment when the atoning work of Christ is applied to our lives by faith, and we are declared justified or righteous before God. Sanctification is more than a moment. Sanctification is a process of our being conformed to the image of Christ. It's a process that begins at the moment of justification, and sanctification ends at glorification, which happens when you die or when Jesus returns. And while we are helpless at justifying ourselves before God, we learn here that we are not helpless in the process of sanctification. Because of the enlivening power of the resurrection of Jesus, you and I have the capacity to help our sanctification along. And so Paul begins to exhort his readers accordingly. So, interestingly, we're in chapter 6 of Romans, and he's only now beginning to exhort the Christians in Rome. In the first five chapters, he's just laying out doctrinal points, one after the other. But now he's pivoting to application. He's pivoting to our sanctification. And as such, he begins his exhortations in verse 11. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Do you see how Paul's very first exhortation targets the mind? It targets the way we think, the way we assess reality. You see, what we do and how we behave is largely a function of what we think and what we believe reality to be. And so if our actions go sideways, it usually means that we're no longer apprehending reality correctly. So Paul's prescription in verse 11, I don't want you to think of it as some kind of mental trickery, nor is he applying some kind of mind over matter principle but rather he's aiming to calibrate our convictions according to what is true. Friends, how does a person calibrate their beliefs according to what is true? We give attention to what God has said in his word. And so we need to be convinced in our mind, first of all, regarding our new relationship with sin. And that is that sin no longer has dominion over us. It once did, but it no longer does in Christ. Secondly, we need to be convinced of the reality that we actually have access to this resurrection power in Christ Jesus. These are things we must count and regard and believe in our mind. And then once we've 
affirm them in our mind, Paul now deals with the human will. He makes a transition between what our mind must do and what our will must do, and he does this using a transitional word, therefore. Since you are dead to sin, and since you are alive to Christ, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Friends, do you see how the death and resurrection of Jesus is designed to dramatically change the way you live today? It's not just for when I die benefit. It's not like God's engaged in estate planning with us. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to the Christian now. And too many Christians limit the implications of Christ's death and resurrection to when we die. But what we learn from Paul is that it ought to change who we are in the present. We are dead to sin through the death of Jesus today. We are alive to Christ through Christ's resurrection today. And on this basis, we refuse to let sin carry the day in our life. We refuse to let sin reign. There's also a positive command in here as well. Not only are we to use resurrection power to resist and to refuse sinful ways, but we're to use resurrection power positively as we seek to represent Jesus in the world today. So rather than give in to our sinful impulses, Paul urges us in verse 13. He says, Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Friends, I want you to note the progression Paul is, is a very good theologian, and he's an excellent writer. And there is an obvious and explicit progression in how he exhorts the Christians in Rome and how he exhorts us today. In verse 11, we have the first exhortation, where he calls our minds to deem something. That's an unusual word, deem, but I want to use all D words, and it's the only one I could come up with that otherwise it would break down the D's. First, he calls our minds to deem something. Secondly, he calls our wills to decide something. Thirdly, he calls for our bodies to do something. And that which we are to deem, decide, and do is to be accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And the purpose for which we are to deem, decide, and do is the glory of God. That's why we engage in this manner. Paul says we present ourselves to whom? To God. We present our bodies to whom? To God. How? As instruments for his righteousness. Again, the death and resurrection of Jesus does not simply change the ending for us. It's designed to change the here and the now. The entire trajectory of our life is to be turned around. So we no longer live for ourselves governed by our own desires. We live for God, and we're animated by His Holy Spirit. Even the word instrument itself is suggestive to our posture. The word instrument is very important here. Now, artificial intelligence and robots notwithstanding... An instrument normally has an operator. I realize 10 years from now, I won't even be able to say that because all instruments will probably function uh, 
robotically or by AI. But at the moment, instruments generally need operators. I can assure you, and you, you've witnessed this, the piano did not play itself this morning. The drums are not playing themselves this morning. Operators are needed. You look at words on the screen, there's media equipment being employed and there are operators needed to employ it. Every single day of our life, we use a myriad of instruments to go about our daily life. We, we use the instrument of our phone. We use the instruments of our kitchen appliances. We use the instruments of our vehicle. And all of these instruments require operators. And so we go through our lives day by day, functioning as operators of instruments. So hear this out. We go through our lives day by day acting as operators of instruments. But when it comes to the Christian life, there's a profound role reversal. You see, we're no longer the operators. We're the instruments. We function according to the sovereign use and design of another. Friends, if you want to know what the purpose of your life is, it's here in this text. The death and resurrection of Jesus has positioned us to be instruments in his hand and to be used for his glory. Paul has said this elsewhere to the Corinthians. He writes, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So friends, on this Resurrection Sunday, I urge you to use resurrection power. To be instruments to be presented to God as instruments for righteousness, living not for yourself, but for him who died for you and who is raised from the dead. Amen.